Hello everyone. So this bad dream, let's talk about this bad dream. So I first had this dream around 25 years ago. And um, what it is, is that in the dream, in the dream, hey Mark, in the dream, I'm a dog. I'm a dog in Cuda. And it was more like a nightmare than a dream, right? It was, it, was, it was a nightmare. It's one of these, you know the dreams that you have where you are so into it, like you actually think it is 100% certain that this thing is happening, right? And then the only way you know that it's not happening is when you wake up and then you realize, thank God. So I'm a dog in Cuda, right? And, and I'm thinking like a dog and... All I can, you know, think to myself is, fuck, this is it. You're a dog, right? You're a dog in Cuda. And, um, and I'm really depressed about it because in the dream, I'm being envious of, of, of dogs that are in other places, like they're not in Bali, you know? And for some reason, I've got this association that dogs in Cuda were skinny and no one would feed them and they would sort of just be walking through the streets homeless with no one looking after him and um uh, and i know this sounds weird and I, I probably should you know if take it up with someone that reads dreams or i don't know a psychologist but then what's happened is this dreams come back a few times right over the years and it's a nightmare and i wake up and i'm thinking fuck that fucking dream again so um all i can say to you is that one of the things about the dream but is that I'm so, hey Josh, how you going? Good to see you. Another guy that's doing over 100 sales a year. Incredible. First year in real estate. Fucking, I look at Lisa Novak. Started doing work with her. Told her to go on hardball on social. Look at what she's doing. Anyway, let me get back to this damn dream. This damn dream is about the fact that, you know, you're a dog in, in, in Bali, right? And you're stuck because there's nothing you can fucking do, right? And then you wake up and then you realize, shit, you know what? Um, excellent. I'm not a dog in Bali. I've got choices. I'm a human being. I can go get a job. I can actually get on a plane and go move to another country. I can actually, you know, exercise today, I can plan my day, I can go shopping at Woolworths. And then it got me thinking that we do take, we do take the birth lottery for granted, right? Like to me, the biggest lottery in life is the birth lottery, right? Like a dog is, you know, uh, a, a living being, right? Um, a tree is a living being, right? Um, so you turn around and you have, you know, we have no right. We have no right to actually expect to have a, a better, a better run in life than, than, than a, than a girl that is born in Somalia that is malnutritioned, who lives in poverty and who will die before the age of 10. We have no right in the birth lottery, yet we still find reason to be pissed off with what we have been given as our ticket in the birth lottery, right? Um, and for me, I think to myself that um, we must acknowledge on a regular basis, like just picture this for a moment, just picture for a moment, picture for a moment that you are the creator of the birth lottery, right? You work out that you know you're going to be born in Syria. You're going to you're a dog in Cuda. You're a tree in Melbourne. You're a human being in New York. You're a, you're a, you're a, you're a, you're a girl. You're a girl in Saudi Arabia, right? You're a girl in Saudi Arabia. You shut up. You go over there. That's where you're going to be, right? And what you'll be is here. You here, my friend, are going to be. You're going to be, you're going to be a cat in Greece. You're going to be a cat in Greece. So what actually happens is that you're the person that's got to divide it all up. And hypothetically speaking, you turn around and you, 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 you will not pick 
the dog in Cuda, right? You will not pick the girl in Somalia, right? You wouldn't pick it because knowing what you know now, you'll think to yourself, hey, look, it's pretty good here. I'll take this. Now, gang, the reason I share this story is that I think that we do take for granted the birth lottery. And I think that one of the things that you've got to do on a regular basis is to turn around and say to yourself, what's great in my life? What's great in my life? Chances are, if you are watching this right now or watching it on replay, um, man, all I can say is that you're probably in the top 5% in the birth lottery scenario of the world. So, um, gang, that's the dream. And all I can tell you is that I wake up and I think to myself, I'm happy I'm not a dog in CUDA, right? Because I've got options. And what does that mean? What does it mean? Um, it means, I think, it means that if you're not happy at the moment with your life, do you realize that you have choices, that you can make a decision? You see, like, even maybe a dog in CUDA could do the dog paddle and fucking you know, swim to Singapore, right? I suppose you could do that, but maybe you couldn't. The point I'm making is if you're a human being, you've got the ability to make a choice, make a decision to change the course and direction of your life. You are not a tree. Think about it. You can move. Imagine being a tree. Imagine being a tree on a busy road. You fucking sit there. You wake up. You look at the other tree each morning. What are you doing today? Well, what the fuck am I doing? I'm in the same spot I've been for 77 years. I've got no option. Anyway, that's the dream. Now, I met someone today that really gave me the shits. And the reason why he gave me the shits is he said two things that used what I call anecdotal evidence. Do you, and, and, and I believe that anecdotal evidence is the number one error trap that people make. It's like the guy that says, I had an uncle that smoked all his life and died at 98 from old age. Didn't die of lung cancer. Or the person that turns around and says, uh, no, mate, uh, prospecting in the morning doesn't work in our area. You know, tried it, mate, no one was home, right? So here's the problem with anecdotal evidence. What it does is it uses a very small sample size. It has no scientific rigor to it, right? It has no evidence base to it. It's basically someone giving an opinion on a very small sample size, like this dickhead today that was absolutely adamant, I think it's overrated, smoking's bullshit, had an uncle of mine, fucking smoked two packs, two packs a day, 60 years, mate, lived to 98. Well, hello, why don't you get a sample size of a thousand people that did that and then come up with a decision or any view that you've got, whether it's bloody, some people turn around and say, no, 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 prospecting, door knocking doesn't work, did it once, fucking hit the door, don't like it in my area. Guys and girls, I want you to understand anecdotal evidence is a mental trap that we fall into in a lot of the decisions that we make. And all I will say to you is that it is most likely faulty error decision making because it's based on a very small sample size. Let's move on. So we talked about the bad dream. And I also want to talk to you about, you know, during the week, like on Monday, I have various tests throughout the year to ensure that I am healthy, which I am. Anyway, cut, uh, cut to the chase. I'm sort of walking out of uh, Lifehouse, RPA Lifehouse. Royal Prince Alfred Hospital has a cancer ward called Chris O'Brien Lifehouse. Now, Chris O'Brien was the doctor on the show RPA. And he was a brain surgeon that used to, that used to, uh, actually, Jason has just asked me to request to be in this video and I've never done it before. Let's just bring him in. Jason from Barry Plant. Let's bring him in. Go live. Hello, Jason. 
Jason's declined. He, sorry, Jason's declined. Anyway, let's keep moving on. He, he's done what a lot of people do, and that is that they press the wrong button there, and then when they realize that they're on live, they actually decline. Jason, I think I'm seeing you next week. I think so. Anyway, let me just move on and talk to you about what happened. So I leave RPA Lifehouse, Chris O'Brien. So this guy, he had brain cancer. Anyway, incredible story. He used to cure people of brain cancer by doing the surgery. And, um, and then the most ironic, quite sad thing happened. And then he got diagnosed with brain cancer. So Chris O'Brien died. So many of you know the story. He was the, the main doctor on the show, RPA. So Chris O'Brien died. And anyway, what has been built is the Chris O'Brien Lifehouse, which is a center of quite extraordinary meditation, alternative medicine, cannabis, you name it. They have got, it is just like, it is like the hotel of treatment centers. So his wife, Gail, I sort of run into downstairs. She doesn't really know me, right? Spoken to her on the phone once when I was doing some charity raising many years ago. And she's so nice to me, right? Um, just very nice, kind, compassionate. And it was a quick three minute conversation. So as I'm driving, someone rings me and I just said to them, hey, I just got off the, you know, uh, having a conversation with Gail O'Brien. And this guy on the phone says to me, incredible lady, gee, she's had a lot of bad luck. I said, yeah, tell me about it. her husband there. She goes, oh, no, no, more than that. So here's the story and you can Google it. A year after her husband dies, her young son, I think in his early 20s, he, um, he, uh, he dies from an epileptic fit and it came out of nowhere. Apparently, he, they didn't even know he had epilepsy, right? So just picture that. Then what happens soon after that? Her daughter, her daughter, her young daughter gets diagnosed with cancer. And I don't know how that story has ended. But I just thought to myself, well, like, fucking wow, like, everything's great, you're on TV, you're the doctor there, life's good, you die, your son dies, your daughter gets cancer. So for Gail O'Brien, just one of these events, gang, one of these events is major, if you really think about it. Just one of these events would actually stretch someone to incredible sort of lengths. Just one of the events, right? But this person, Gail O'Brien, right, has had to suffer three of these. And she said something very, very interesting in the conversation to me. I said to her, Gail, do you come here every day? She goes, most days. I find that this place here gives me meaning and just having frivolous friendships with people that really don't matter doesn't do it for me. Guys and girls, guys and girls, think about this woman, husband and two kids. And that's why, my friends, Chris O'Brien Lifehouse is the place Whenever there's money to be donated, it gets a lot, but keep them in mind. Anyway, let's move on. I want to talk to you about another very important law, and that is... Oh, by the way, you know anecdotal evidence? I'll never forget it. I'll never forget anecdotal evidence. I had, I had a guy say to me, this is when I was single, right? When I was single, when I was young... Um, 21, 22 years of age, he said to me, listen, mate, if you want to pick up, you've got to go to the airport Hilton. I think it used to be called Amy's, right? The airport Hilton. Saturday night, right? Saturday night, mate. Went there 100%. That's the place where you are going to meet a girl 100%, right? And uh, you want to talk about anecdotal evidence? I went there for fucking three fucking years and then decided to stop going because nothing happened. Let's move on. Let's move on. The law of critical mass. 
The law of critical mass. This is another law I want to educate my audience on. Danny Hayes, good to see you back, guys. Get on Danny's YouTube channel, Million Dollar Bogan. Press the subscribe button and fucking watch his videos. Bernard Desmond, the man that is the mortgage broker. There's another guy that I've trained. And guess what? He's the best mortgage broker in fucking Australia. Two years in a row. So proud of you, Bernard. Anyway, guys, three years, was it right at the airport? <laughs> yes, it was right at the airport. It was the airport Hilton. Let me just finish off uh, the law of critical mass. The law of critical mass. You know when the fax machines, you know when the fax machines were invented? 1840. Do you believe that? And do you realize, guys and girls, that that fax machine in the 1840s never did anything. And the reason why is this. They were expensive and only two people could afford a fax machine. So what that meant is that the value of the fax machine was really irrelevant because if you were going to fax a piece of paper, only one person would actually get it because no one else had a fax machine. And then guess what? When did the fax machine become mainstream? In the early 90s, because the price of a fax machine had got to next to nothing, and then everyone had a fax machine, which meant that you could fax things to lots of people. This, my friends, the law of critical mass has meant why many companies have made a killing in the last few years. Think, think about this for a moment. Think about this for a moment. Think about Uber drivers. Think about, think about Uber drivers. Think about Uber drivers for a moment. Uber drivers, my friend, when did Uber drivers, when did Uber drivers really kick off? Because when there's a lot of Uber drivers, all of a sudden the business becomes viable. Viable, my friends, guys and girls. Man. I'm saying to you, property management, in property management, you know what? Think about that. There's a certain number that it becomes viable. Bang. Think about other things. Sales staff, when you run a business, there's a certain amount when it becomes viable. Guys and girls, that law, the law of critical mass is absolutely mandatory in the world of business. It explains why something might not work at one time and then works at another time. So gang, on that point, I got a massive week. We've got Gold Coast, number one. Tomorrow, we've got two days in Melbourne. I'm coming back on Melbourne on Wednesday, coming back on Thursday for Sydney PRD conference, then back to Melbourne for the Ray White National Conference. Got three workshops in Melbourne on Wednesday. So it's all on. Um, and by the way, there's a guy there who's a troller. I can, I can keep seeing him coming up. Guys and girls, can you do me a favor? Can you guys on Facebook fucking handle that for me? And let me tell you, one of the best ways to handle trollers, you got to understand, a troller is basically driven. Let's talk about trollers for a moment. They're basically driven because they want attention. They're saying, fucking listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. Number one, that's a reason. Number two is they're very, very lonely. They're very, very lonely, right? Uh, number three, number three is that unfortunately, some trollers are very jealous. And what actually happens is that 
they don't like when one person's got attention, right? And what actually happens is that they go, meow. And I think it's really interesting because on social media, I think that if you're building a personal brand, you have to accept that you're going to have people that are trollers, right? And it's nice and safe. They can sort of sit there quietly in their little fucking basement, one bedroom unit like a fucking weirdo, right? And no one's going to touch them, right? But, you know, face to face, like they fucking uh, will just walk and avoid you. But what you've got to understand is this. What you've got to understand is this. That you shouldn't allow, whether it's a competitor, whether it's a troller, whether it's a hater for whatever reason, you shouldn't allow that person to control your behavior because that is the purpose of a troller. That is the purpose of a troller. And I think that a lot of the times people don't go big and play hard on social media, on the personal brand, because they're too obsessed about what other people are going to say. They're too obsessed about what they're going to say. So what actually happens is that they turn around and they say, fuck, I'll do nothing and I'll be safe. Guys and girls, on that point, adios. And do us a favor, press that share button. See you soon.